Awesome. So we will have Doug Micken tonight. Great thing. Invite some people. Um, invite some kids. And it'll be great to then segue right into our Vacation Bible School, which starts tomorrow. And so be praying for our VBS. Come and be a part of um, seeing Doug Micken. It's going to be a great time. Uh, one other uh, thing with this, with Vacation Bible School this next week that I want you to be aware of is the fact that um, next Sunday, remember, we're going to have a celebration service of Vacation Bible School, really a united service, and where the kids are going to do some of the songs, other things that they've learned. You'll get to hear all about VBS. It's going to be great, but we're going to have only one united service next Sunday morning. That will be at 11 a.m., so you can come here at 8.30 if you would like, and I'd love to visit you with you in my office until Sunday school, all right? We can talk and we can pray with one another. It's going to be great. But really, um, man, we want you to see these kids, see what they've learned. If you know anything about, you know, Vacation Bible School, we all have those stories of people we know whose lives were changed forever by VBS. In fact, if you look at the history of the American church, there's been no greater evangelistic outreach in our nation than Vacation Bible School. Nearly 90% of people who come to faith in Christ come to faith before the age of 18. And so if we can get kids in here, get them to hear the gospel, and God can change lives for eternity. So I want you to be praying for our Vacation Bible School, praying for our workers as they're continuing to get things ready. And if you go walk into your Sunday school class this morning and there's a lot of interesting decorations, you know, what I like to say, just like I tell my kids, you know, we look, we don't touch, right? We look with our eyes, not with our hands. But there's a lot of de decor all over the church. It's a lot of fun. Um, and really excited about VBS. But no, we will have only one united service next Sunday as we celebrate Vacation Bible School. Um, one other thing, just so you know, for next week, there are these different forms out. I know um, we're going to have one special called business meeting next Sunday right after the service just to vote on scholarship recipients for next year. So we want to make sure that these students um, that the scholarship committee is recommending get these scholarships, that they get them in time to apply them to their fall um, semesters. And so next Sunday, we'll have a, just a short special called business meeting where we can vote to approve those scholarship recipients. So just something in, important that we want to do is uh, support those students as they're continuing um, their education. If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, continuing our summer series through the parables of Jesus. Uh, I was so thankful for uh, Chris Fisbeck, one of our deacons who stepped in and preached last Sunday. Um, I got to preach uh, last Sunday in um, San Pedro de Macaris, and um, yeah, I, you can imagine me trying to wait on a translator, right? So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> But it was great to see God move, loved that we had um, church on. Uh, we had, were able to, uh, I know God, Chris preached the word well here, and it was wonderful to be down in the Dominican. Um, enjoyed that a lot. I know you can talk with the Pots as well about their, um, uh, about their trip with, uh, uh, with the builders and what the work that they did as well. I'm just so thankful for a church that's on mission. So one thing that you can target is August 7th, that Sunday evening, we're going to have a special service where we can celebrate all of the different things that God did through our multiple mission endeavors this summer. We've had multiple people or teams go overseas. We've had different, um, you know, different, low, you know, church trips here nationally. And so I think we're going to be celebrating six or seven different trips that Sunday evening. You're going to get to hear all about them, hear testimonies about how God moved and worked. So set aside that evening. You'll be used to coming here on Sunday evenings anyways because of the summer concert series. And so just add one more Sunday on, on the 7th and you'll get to hear about what, what God did through these uh, different mission trips. I'm so thankful that we are a church that is on mission. Um, so encouraging to me. 
And you know, as we think about being on mission, about living our lives for the Lord, you know, one, one other way that we live our lives for the Lord is through the giving of our tithes and offerings. So if you're here with us in person, there's different boxes. You can drop off your tithes or offerings in those boxes this uh, morning as you leave the sanctuary. If you're joining us online, we're so thankful that you're joining us this morning. You can give through our app or through our website, or you can mail in um, that tithe or offering. So... Um, so thankful we can worship God that way and really um, be support, and really that helps support those different missions, endeavors that we've been um, participating in. So yeah, with all that being said, I hope you've made your way turning to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And, and let me really kind of set the context uh, for this parable today. Uh, to set the context, Jesus is really wanting to reemphasize to his followers the importance of prayer. And what he's going to lay out here is a model prayer. All right, this is a version of the Lord's Prayer. We know there's a longer version in the book of Matthew, but he's going to um, kind of lay out a model prayer for the disciples, and he's going to go on and continue with the parable explaining the, yes, the importance of prayer prayer. If you think about Jesus and you think about what was going on in his life, Jesus was probably the busiest person ever on the face of the earth who had his whole ministry packed in just three years, right? And he was going everywhere and doing everything and healing people and preaching and touching lives. And yet Jesus found time to get away and spend time with the Lord in prayer. And the disciples noticed that. And they saw that Jesus, in the midst of his busyness, would find that time to get away and get and pray. And they saw how in step the Son of God was with his Father's will. So the disciples went to Jesus and they just said, Jesus, would you please teach us how to pray? Teach us how to be in holy communion with you. Build this relationship. And so Jesus was willing to teach them how to pray. Not only does he teach them how to pray, but then he gives a parable, this story, to show them the importance of prayer. So with all that being said, I'd ask for you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word this morning. One of our students, Joey, is reading to us from Luke chapter 11. He also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer them. Then he will answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up and to give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you so much. God, we are thankful for your word. And God, just as the disciples asked your son, we pray, God, that you would teach us how to pray. God, that you would teach us to rely completely on you. Lord, we ask that, Lord, you would open our hearts to receive your word. God, I pray you'd hide me behind your cross. And God, that you would speak, your spirit would move. Lord, let us be a praying church. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.
Jesus starts by modeling to them how to pray. He's off, he's praying in this place, and then when he's finished, one of his disciples says, Lord, teach us how to pray. And what happened is these followers of Jesus who are walking right beside him, they understood their great need, the need to pray. And for us to be people of prayer, we must understand our great need. To be people of prayer, we must understand our great need. You know, if we're all honest, or if most of us are honest, we might have a problem maintaining a disciplined prayer life. Maybe it's just me. But there are times when we talk about it that, and we think that, well, this lack of a consistent prayer life is a self-discipline problem. That's kind of what we think. It's like the, hey, I, you know, I get up and I, I, run three, I run three mornings a week. Well, this last week I was in the Dominican and I sweat a whole lot there. I sure didn't do much running, but I sure did a lot of eating as well, okay? That food was unbelievable. The church prepared a lot, and I just feel like if people work that hard to prepare food, you need to honor them by eating a lot of it, right? Right? That is the polite thing to do. So I ate a whole lot of food. I usually don't drink soda, all right? But um, when you're tired and there's caffeine and sugar, I drank soda, all right? So I was just going all down. So I, d- I did not run, ate a whole lot of food this last week. And so tomorrow morning, you know, we have VBS. So I'm going to have to go running at about 6 if I want to run. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> but it might, and it's easy to kind of fall out of that and I can be like, oh man, next thing I know, I haven't run in a few different weeks. And then I start losing all that and I'm like, oh, well, I just have to be more disciplined. And sometimes we think about that about prayer. Like, I just need to discipline myself more to spend time with the Lord. And that is, in a sense, true. But really, Yes, we need to work on our self-discipline, but prayerlessness is not really a discipline problem. Prayerlessness at its core is a gospel problem. And here's the thing. If we don't pray, if we don't pray, it means one of two things. We are either unaware of our need, unaware of our need, or we are un convinced of God's willingness to help. So do we understand how much we need God? I think um, because, you know, me and my boys are super classy, we were uh, down when we were in Texas, we went to go visit um, my brother-in-law and his wife, and there just so happened to be a pro wrestling event in Dallas, Texas. So me being the dad that I am, I took my two boys, my brother-in-law came along, and we went to this pro wrestling event. It was a lot of fun, all right? And we're up, and we're kind of up in the nosebleeds, and as we're sitting there, I, I realize that Isaiah, as he's standing up, the whole time these, these wrestlers are coming and there's these matches, we all can see without a problem. And Isaiah's standing up there, and he is squinting terribly bad. Every time, I'm like, are you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm just trying to see better. I'm like, buddy, like, yeah, we're up here a little bit. It's very, these, these wrestlers are very large individuals, and it's easy to see them. And he was just squinting and squinting and squinting. And I thought, what is going on with this kid? He was eight years old at the time. And so afterwards, we took him to the eye doctor. Like we were there in, in Texas. I remember we went, walked into some eye doctor um, just because I was like, there's got to be something wrong. And I remember Jill called the school. 
And school's like, no, he passed his, he had, he perfectly passed his eye test. And I go and ask him, I said, buddy, could you not, he's like, no, I couldn't see. I said, but you passed your eye exam just this fall at school, no problem. He goes, no, dad, I listened to what all the other kids were saying. <laughs> and I just repeated it. <laughs> I memorized, I repeated it, and we took him to the eye doctor. And the eye doctor was like, this kid is blind as a bat. I mean, she wasn't that blunt. But he needed glasses. Now, he'd never had glasses. He didn't realize how terrible his vision was. So I remember we're walking through, I think it was Walmart. He was like, Dad, I can read that sign. Dad, I know that. I was like, oh, man, we were parents of the year, right? It's but he didn't realize his need. He just memorized what the other kids were saying. He'd done it. He wanted to get a, you know, wanted to pass the vision test. So he had. And it wasn't until we got there and the lady was like, you need it right now. I should have thought, you know, both Jill and I desperately need contacts, glasses, and a bit to be order, you know, in order to see. And so Isaiah was the same way. Well, he didn't realize how much he needed it. I didn't until we're at this event and he's squinting. I thought, that is not normal. And then we went to get the glasses to get that thing corrected. Once we saw and understood his need, we wanted to help the issue. In the same way what Jesus is communicating to us in this parable is that we have a good father who wants to step in and help. Look, first Jesus teaches us this prayer. He says to them, whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. So he says, as you start out to pray, you start out by giving God all glory, honor, and praise. Because God and God alone is worthy of praise. Then he transitions, and look, right after, he says, we start out by giving God glory, acknowledging him, as our creator, our savior, our sustainer, as the only one worthy of praise. Then notice what happens in verse 3. Give us each day our daily bread. That's a petition, right? God, I'm asking for you to give me something. I'm petitioning to you. Then, and forgive us our sins, petition. For we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us. Do not bring us into temptation, petition. He starts off by saying... Give glory to God. And then reach out to the Father and ask him to meet your needs. In a sense, we have to acknowledge that we can't do it on our own. We have to acknowledge that we can't do it on our own. Now, really, we get to the main point of this parable right in here. He, he starts off, he says, he says to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I don't have anything to offer him. So here's the parable that Jesus starts to set up. In the ancient Near East, hospitality is king. They had a, this individual in this story has a friend that shows up at his house late at night and this friend is asking for bread and the owner of the house doesn't have bread to give him now in ancient near east culture and really in many cultures today when you have guests hospitality is paramount and so if you have someone that shows up and they need something, it is on you to make sure that you meet that guest's need. When that guest is in your house, under your roof, they are your responsibility. And you're going to, you treat them like family. I said this was something for us that we saw in the, in the Dominican where as we went around prayer walking, and we'd walk into these homes that were, I mean, just sometimes thrown together with just sheet metal. And yet, these people would stand up from whatever chair they're in, and they'd want you to sit in the chair, and they'd want to offer you 
something to eat, and they were just very, very hospitable. And I was trying to explain to the pastor that we were traveling, Pastor Andres, I said, yeah, if you go door to door here, knock on the door, Americans, we just pretend like you're not, that no one's at the door, right? <laughs> that you're not home. <laughs> you think it's a salesman, I don't want to deal with it, right? But there, people were so willing, they opened their home, they were hospitable. In fact, in our prayer walking, we got to see one one, one woman, Ava, who accepted the Lord. It was amazing. But in the same way, in the ancient Near East, it is your responsibility to care for that person. This traveler had come a long way. They needed bread. And so this man, he didn't have any. So he starts going, and he's bothering his neighbors now, Right? He says, I have a friend of mine on a journey. He's come to me. I don't have anything to offer him. Then listen to what he says. I guess this guy on the inside was American. Then he'll answer from the inside, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up to give you anything. Then he says, I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's shameless boldness, he'll get up and give him as much as he needs. This main point of the parable, God is willing and ready to meet our needs. God's willing and ready to meet our needs. This man went to a friend with boldness saying, I need to meet the needs of this traveler. When Isaiah, we realized he could not see. We went straight to the eye doctor to get him glasses to help him out. I wasn't aware of that need right away, but as soon as I saw it, I stepped in. How often do we need to hear from God's word? How often do we need the comfort of his spirit? How often do we need God to move and work and we miss out? Because we're not realizing how we need to be dependent on God. Him. Jesus starts off with this model prayer to us. He says, start off by acknowledging that you are not God. We are not in control of our lives. God is sovereign. God is in control. God is the only one who deserves glory and honor and praise. So to be people of prayer, we must understand our great need. But also, to be people of prayer, we must understand God's great willingness. To be people of prayer, we must understand God's great willingness. Now, what we need to do is we need to drill into the heart of Christ explaining this parable. And the important thing to note is this parable is a contrast. It's the only way for us to really understand this parable correctly. It says, so I say to you, in verse 9, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then listen to these absurd examples he uses. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish... We'll give him a snake instead of a fish. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? Why does Jesus use this absurd example? Saying, oh, yeah, your kid asks. Or a fish, and you're going to give him a snake. He asks for an egg, you're going to give him a scorpion. He really wants us to realize how good he is. 
You see, I think this parable is oftentimes misunderstood. I really think it's actually, uh, you know, the title of it is called The Parable of the Persistent Friend. And many times people try to connect this parable to the one that um, Logan preached earlier this summer. The parable of the persistent widow who went to the judge again and again and again. And what people will say with this is, hey, just pray more. Pray more, persist. You can get what you need. Get what you want, excuse me. And what Jesus is communicating to us is that God doesn't always give us what we want. This isn't just pray for the Lamborghini again and again and again and again, then it's going to show up in your driveway. That's not what this is. It's not about God giving us what we want. What this parable Jesus communicates us very clearly is that God gives us what we need when we seek him. He gives us what we need. You know, verse 9 is one of the most misunderstood verses in Scripture. I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. This verse is understood. It's not a blank check. This isn't Lamborghini, $5 million. Man, a really, really good steak. Any of those things, right? Right? That's not what this is. I can still remember when Isaiah was, I think he was five or six. Now, Isaiah's full in preteen mode, and so he sleeps in now. But it used to be, so in my house, I'm the, I'm the early riser, Jill sleeps in. Well, well back, back then when Isaiah was younger, he would get up early with me. And I'd be, you know, reading scripture, coffee, other things like that, and so Isaiah wanted someone to pray with. So he would go in, five-year-old Isaiah and go wake up his two-year-old brother <laughs> to, play, to play with, right? And like Isaiah, you have to stop waking up Caleb. He needs to sleep longer. And Isaiah, being a pastor's kid at five, goes, no, dad, God tells me that Caleb is awake. <laughs> God tells me. <laughs> I was like, really, buddy? I was like, well, why don't we do this? Let's just check. And, you know, um, if God's really telling you that, well, what I'll do is I'll just look at the monitor. And I'll see if he is actually awake, right? And here, as we pray, God's spirit can move and work in us. But God is never going to tell us something that is contrary to his word, Right? Just like I was able to go to the monitor and be like, Isaiah, uh, yeah, not, not awake quite yet. In the same way, as we pray and we seek the Lord, what we do is we dive into his word. And we see what is it that we need. Because what's very clear here, look what he says. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. There's a clear understanding that God will answer us. God will answer us. But here's the key, just not always in the way that we expect. God answers us, just not always in the way that we expect. He tells us very clearly that he will respond to our need. He is our heavenly father, and he will do no less for his children than an earthly father would. Just like an earthly father would never give a snake to his son when his son asks for a fish, or a scorpion when his child asks for an egg. In the same way, God will never do less than an earthly father. And also, God is perfect and will do much more than sinful man would. But here's the key. God knows what we need most. God knows what we need most. Think about when our kids are ill. You know, it seems like some of the medicine they need the most tastes the worst to, the, to our children, right? And yet, when my kids 
have fevers, they're dealing with illness, even when the medicine tastes terrible, and they don't want any part of it, as a loving father, the best thing that I can do for them is not say, oh, you don't want this medicine? Okay, have some ice cream instead, right? The most loving thing that I can do is make sure that they take the medicine even though they don't like it. Because I know that it is going to treat the issue. You know, there's this incredible song, this, this song out of Laura's story, she wrote it, but she said this. Uh, just listen to these words. What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if the trials of this life are your blessings in disguise? For many of us, as we pray and we seek the Lord, we might want relief from something. Just like Paul, remember he had that thorn in his flesh. Three different times he's crying out to God saying, God, take this thorn from me. God, re remove this physical issue. God, I need your help. It was a debilitating physical issue with Paul. And what is God's response to Paul? He says, no. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. He's saying that physical ailment, Paul, the greatest missionary, right? He's saying that's a reminder to you daily that you need me. And when you are weak, then I am strong. My grace is enough. God knows what we need the most. So yes, we ask, we seek, we knock. We boldly make our petitions to God. But as we make those petitions, what we do is we lay aside our own desires and say, God, not my will, but yours be done. We pray for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And look what he says. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This last verse should completely reassure us, whatever we're walking through. More than anything else, God knows what we need. And you know what we need? The best gift we get is God himself. The best gift that we get is God himself. You know what he promises us? He promises us his Holy Spirit. What a promise, right? And what power. What a promise. If you notice, every time God calls us to be on mission for him, he tells us that we're to go to make disciples of all nations, right? And he says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He promises us his presence there. We think, he says, you'll receive power, Acts 1.8, when my Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So he says, this is how you can walk victoriously in this life. This is how you can be on mission for God. This is how you can have an abundant life. It's by walking in step with the Spirit. God says, more than the trinkets of this world, what we need the most is to be empowered by his spirit. More than anything else, God knows that we need him. We need him. It's not all this stuff. We need God. We need the spirit, and we need to let him do what only he 
can do. Do we understand this incredible gift that God gives us? God himself has turned our bodies into his temple. He dwells inside of us and he empowers us to walk in boldness, to walk in faith. You see, this parable is not primarily saying persist, 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 and God will give you what you need or give you what you want, excuse me. It is you go to God and you trust that God will give you what you need. He says what you need is to be empowered by the Spirit. What you need is to die to self and live for Him. What we need is to set aside our preferences, our desire, our will, and ask that God's will be done. In 1857 in New York City, this guy, Jeremiah Lanfear, he was hired to be an evangelist, to visit a local neighborhood, and to go around and to bring people to Christ. He became very discouraged and frustrated. People weren't open. They weren't responding to the gospel. And when he was frustrated, he started to turn to prayer. And then he found himself experiencing the presence of God. And one day, what he did is he put out a sign in front of a church, and he said, he just invited people to come and pray. It was during the lunch hour. Be no preaching, no sermon, just praying. That first Wednesday, six people showed up to pray. The second Wednesday, 20 people showed up to pray. The third Wednesday, 40 people showed up to pray. And then someone at that point said, we need to do that every, we need to do this every day during lunch, every day. Two months later, the whole auditorium was filled with hundreds of people praying every day at noon. So they started other prayer meetings around New York City at noon. So the entire downtown area, every theater, every church was filled with men and women praying. Reporters estimated that up to 10,000 people were praying every day in lower Manhattan. Churches then began having evening services, and people started coming and receiving Christ. In a nine-month period in New York City, 50,000 people came to Christ. The population in New York City was about 800,000 at the time. So if you think of our population, 2.8 million in the St. Louis area, right? That'd be like 175,000 people coming to Christ over the next nine months. Jeremiah stepped back and just started seeking the Lord. Said, God, not my will, but yours. What would happen, church, if we started seeking God in that way? It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. It says, God wants to empower us with his spirit. How much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I want to encourage you this next week daily to be praying for our Vacation Bible School that God would move. I want to encourage you and be a part of our Prayer Warriors ministry. Remember, you know, the first Sunday of every month, 8 o'clock, we gather together to pray. Church, let's relentlessly ask, seek, and knock for God's will to be done. He's done it before. He could do it again. If you study every major revival in history, it all starts with prayer. Jesus
Jesus modeled prayer. And he said, this is what it is. If people come, come to me, Jesus says. Go to the Father. Ask him to work in your life. And what will God do? God will empower us with his spirit. What could God do in and through each and every one of us if we simply said, God, not my will, but yours be done. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're so thankful for your word. God, we're so thankful for the promise of your presence in our lives. God, that we can seek you, we'll find you, and we seek you with all of our hearts. So God, I pray that you would help us, Lord. Help us to continue asking, Lord, to continue seeking, God, to continue knocking. Lord, we're so thankful that you're a good Father who gives us good gifts. So I pray, God, that we would acknowledge our need for you. God, I pray you'd empower each of us with your spirit. Remind us of your presence. God, let us be on mission for you. God, I pray right now if there's anyone in this room, anyone joining us online that's never made that decision to trust in you, God, I pray that they would open their hearts, invite your spirit in now. God, we pray for you to be at work in this place. It's in your son's name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.